enough of my blabbering away, I'd like to turn it over to Norm if you want to say a few words or to Matt and we can get started. No, just go directly to, to, to Matt. We're, we're anxious to hear from him. Okay. All right. All right. Well, here we go. Uh, well, thanks everyone for, uh, for tuning in. I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to be able to talk some more about India and to give you an idea of some of the really incredible uh, vibrance and diversity of different groups uh, living here and, and hopefully to paint a picture of, uh, you know, how, how, uh, how beautiful and fascinating life is for, for uh, a lot of these people. It's, uh, it's, been, it's been a great opportunity for me, as I was telling Mike, to be able to delve back into uh, these materials that, you know, uh, through my, uh, my time in, in Bombay and, uh, and traveling around elsewhere, I was uh, been really fortunate to be able to, to see a lot uh, and to to visit a lot of different places, to meet a lot of uh, uh, fascinating people, and uh, you know, Rabbi Roman uh, <laughs> sang a song. Uh, Wherever you go, there is always someone Jewish. Uh, <laughs> that was that was hugely influential on me, clearly. And uh, it was it's been it's been fantastic for me to be able to discover that for myself, and and now to uh, pass that on to uh, to uh, other communities all over so so thanks thanks again for uh for inviting me and and i hope i hope this is interesting and stays interesting and uh if at whatever point i'm uh maybe digging too deep or uh you know people need some sort of clarification i'm, I'm more than happy to uh to back up and to to unpack a little bit uh so uh on that note, I'll just uh, I'll go ahead and introduce myself a little bit. And uh, Matt, just one thing, I, I, Matt. I just wanted to mention to people if they have an idea or a question or whatever, you can use the chat function. So, you okay. So you don't do like I just did, is interrupt you. <laughs> basically, you Got know, it. feel free to type up something, and then you can follow up with that at at the appropriate time. Sounds okay. great. Sounds great. Every these are these are old hands at the at the chat function. You guys. Okay. Clearly, I'll know what you're doing, so I, I, <laughs> I don't need to add anything there. So here we go. Uh, I'm just gonna gonna start with my uh, slide deck here, and uh, thank you, uh, Rabbi Roman, for the title. Uh, what's new, <laughs> Delhi? What's new, Delhi? Uh, Jews in India, uh, and uh, I think that uh, he he chose that title uh, in part because. Uh, it's also the name of my uh, my other business <laughs> when I'm not in uh, in India. I'm uh, I'm usually spending the summers in in Detroit, uh, which is where I grew up. Uh, and we've got uh, a food truck that is an Indian Delhi fusion food truck. It's called New Delhi, uh, and it's a it's a pretty uh, fascinating combination of hometown favorite stuff that we all know and love like a corned beef Reuben uh, or an egg salad or uh, you know we do uh, we do sliders we do all kinds of uh, familiar packages with some really exciting Indian flavors and ingredients uh, built in this is this is an example of our our uh, new Reuben mm. and you can see we're starting with Cy Ginsburg corned beef which is I think Detroit's finest <laughs> and uh, we've got instead of uh, sauerkraut there, you can see there's a it's an Indian slaw. It's got curry leaf in there. It's got uh, a hint of green chili that we slice really super fine so that you get the chili flavor without the heat. Uh, it's got some mustard seed tempering. It's got uh, uh, all sorts of fascinating stuff happening there. And uh, instead of a Thousand Island dressing, we're using a sweet chili mayo. And on top, you're, you're looking at a tandoori crust. We're grilling the whole sandwich in tandoori butter. So, uh, you know, what you can see is that these are, uh, these are sort of traditional uh, ideas that we are trying to give a new twist. It's a, it's a fusion concept. And we're taking all of the exciting flavors, 
the, the interesting techniques and approaches we've learned in India, and we're putting them into packages that, uh, that aren't, aren't too threatening, but then let, let people learn and explore and uh, you know, develop new tastes and interests. So that's, that's our, uh, our new Ruben you're looking at. And we've also got some, uh, some goods on, on shelves packaged products, uh, our tomato chutney, which is something that we, uh, we learned here in India. This is, uh, uh, you know, something we, we put on our hot dogs. It's like ketchup meets mustard meets relish. And they all get together, have a party. It's a, it's a really fun condiment. And, and then these pickles, uh, I learned the, the pickle recipe in India, uh, from, uh, uh, someone from Kazakhstan, and uh, you know we've been using it at the restaurant. We've been putting it, putting a dill pickle in our uh, gin and tonics, and and then uh, when it came time to uh, serve something with the the sandwiches, we we make about uh, you know ten thousand sandwiches a year. So there's a pickle with every sandwich, and that this is you know something that finally we've been able now to to get produced and and jarred, and uh, you know I hope that I hope that everybody likes. The additional, uh, you can see coriander floating up there, but then there's also ginger. There's uh, there's a, a hint of red chili. There's lots of lots of zesty new flavors, and it's something that uh, you know that we always learn in India. Is you just you you learn how to turn it up to eleven. Uh, you 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 never never miss an opportunity to add something fun and exciting where uh, you know where just enough would do. There's always a little bit extra. That's uh, that's India in a nutshell. Uh, I'm talking to you right now from uh, a part of India called Goa. It's on the west coast. Uh, we're we're uh, on one of India's most beautiful beaches right now. If you listen hard, you might even be able to hear waves. Uh, they're coming from that side. It's about I would say 150 200 meters to the beach over there from from where we live. Uh, and uh, Mandram is the name of our town where we have uh, a restaurant. It's called Veranda, uh, and it's on a hillside. You know, as you can see, surrounded by greenery. Uh, we've got all kinds of uh, you know fascinating uh, local plants and fruit trees that we're uh, you know we're foraging from. We're growing some of our own produce, and uh, you know we've created I think a really warm, lovely atmosphere. This is actually our engagement party. <laughs> right here these are all friends but we're uh you know we're uh really happy with what we've been able to uh accomplish now it's eight years that we've been running this restaurant uh in uh in goa uh have a lot more to say about goa uh as well but i think what i'll do is just go ahead and uh and uh move on to uh a little bit more about India, and I thought one way to uh, to discuss India, uh, you know, which is, I think, newly significant, it's uh, newly relevant in lots of ways, would be just to compare it to Israel. Uh, and there are a lot of really fascinating uh, similarities, I think, even though, uh, you know, obviously in terms of size, we're looking at uh, a, a, a scale that is just, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's completely uh, dwarfed. Uh, Israel is completely dwarfed by India, both in, in you know in, in land area and and population, and also the um, you know the now the um, the the amount of <laughs> I would say chaos and uh, you know the 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 rate of development that India is experiencing right now is uh, bewildering, uh, but. The, the two countries, I think, uh, you know, share a lot of similarities in their, their origins. Uh, both of them uh, achieved independence around the same time, uh, India in uh, August 1947 and Israel in 1948. Uh, each of them was uh, ruled by uh, one party, uh, you know, the, essentially the, uh, the, the freedom fighting and the independence party you could say, uh, until exactly 1977 in, uh, in each case. Uh, in both cases, there was, uh, you know, a secular uh, law put into place. In, in the case of India, it was uh, 
very explicit, uh, very explicitly written as a document that was uh, there to to protect uh, minority religions, uh, written by uh, a man uh, named Dr. Uh, Bimra Ambedkar, who uh, was himself a, a religious dissenter and led uh, uh, a movement of conversion from Hinduism to Buddhism uh, amongst the uh, the lower castes uh, as uh, as protest of uh, the the treatment of of uh, lower caste in India. It's a fascinating story in itself. Uh, and now I think in both cases, it's fair to say that we're seeing religious majoritarian parties on the rise and uh, a certain degree in in each case, uh, both India and Israel of illiberalism. You know, in both cases, uh, you know, India in particular calls itself the world's largest democracy. And it indeed, you know, the elections here are uh, an incredible feat. You're you're looking at, uh, you know, so many hundreds of millions of people voting uh, at once. And it's not just the scale, but the diversity of the population. We're talking about, uh, you know, over over 20 official languages. We're talking about places that are so remote, there are no roads and no electricity, and yet it's uh, it's still possible for everyone to vote. So that's, uh, you know, quite an accomplishment. But as uh, Ambedkar himself said, uh, democracy in India is only a top dressing on an Indian soil, which is essentially undemocratic. So I think, uh, you know, since the founding, we've been looking at, um, you know, uh, the the potential for uh, you know, the kind of uh, religious majoritarian movement that we're now seeing, uh, you know, which is uh, in, uh, in control of, uh, of, of parliament uh, and which, you know, it's uh, uh, exerting, exerting control over, over, uh, over the press, over uh, freedom of speech. There's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot to discuss about, about India itself, but I, uh, you know, I want to I want to move on. It's uh, you know, it's just become. I think it's worth noting uh, the, the world's fifth largest economy, and it's also uh, as of last month, the most populous country in the world, just surpassed China, uh, where uh, population growth is uh, is declining now. And in India, it's it's continuing to rise. And uh, you know, as a result, you could say I think uh, growth uh, here has been. Uh, you know, outpacing uh, economic growth, outpacing that in other countries, including the the so-called brick block. You know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, where you're looking at the future of the world's growth in uh, in uh, those countries. Uh, so, you know, there are many hopeful signs as well as some some worrisome signs, and I think it's worth uh, uh, you know keeping track, paying attention, to India as. Uh, you know, as it uh, develops over the next several years. Uh, I want to uh, want to give you a little tour of India. It's, uh, you know, again, it's a huge place. It's uh, it's very diverse. Uh, you know, again, dozens of, of languages. Uh, but in particular, I, I want to discuss the the areas where uh, where Jews uh, are located, have settled. And it's uh, it's a number of different communities of Jews, and uh, the way that I'd like to you know proceed from here is basically take them one by one, and uh, you know it's different groups uh, arriving in India by different means and at different times, and uh, mostly they've come from uh, from Israel or somewhere uh, in the Middle East, and they've landed on the West Coast. As you can see, there's, uh, there's a number of settlements there on the West Coast. And then we've also got a few uh, surprising outliers here uh, on, on the East Coast. And uh, those uh, those might be surprising <laughs> for a lot of people. Uh, and so you'll you'll see that, that each of these groups has different stories and uh, different uh, practices, different ways of life. I'm going to do my best to uh, to describe those. Um, of course, all these groups are, uh, broadly speaking, Sephardic. Uh, 
with the exception, as you'll see, of uh, a bunch of Israelis hanging out in Goa <laughs> near near me, uh, and uh, and uh, you know that that label Sephardic really uh, I think serves to mask uh, a lot of diversity and uh, some really uh, in intriguing uh, stories within within Indian Jewry uh, a as a whole. Uh, so these uh, these areas here you can see they've each got uh, a particular population a particular community of Jews uh, located in each uh, so just to take them one by one uh, we've got the Baghdadi Jews who are centered mostly in uh, Mumbai or Bombay uh, we've got the Bene Israel Jews who uh, are located in Bombay and also uh, further south along the Konkan coast uh that coast stretches down to Goa where I'm located right now uh I I spent about uh, 10 years in in uh, Mumbai before I moved here to Goa so this is an area I'm very familiar with and the Bene Israel are uh you know certainly the ones the the group of of Indian Jews I'm most familiar with uh and I'll have a lot to say about them uh there are uh quite a quite a few Israelis here in Goa and uh that's that's a fun story on its own, I'd, I'd love to talk about them. Further south, we have the Pardesi Jews uh, in uh, in Kerala, and they're based mostly in uh, in Kochi. And then uh, toward toward the east coast, we've got uh, a couple groups of you might say newly minted Jews and uh, it, Jews that have uh, discovered their Jewish connection, their Jewish heritage. Uh, possibly, <laughs> arguably, in in the past uh, 50 or so years. And that's, uh, that's a fascinating story. And, and uh, <laughs> there's, there's not much that's known about it, but I'll get to them as well. So uh, let me start with uh, this, this one group of Jews, they're, they're known as Bene Israel. Uh, they, they are uh, right now, uh, about 3500 in number. You know, we're talking about a country of uh, 1.4 billion, and these are about 3,500 Jews located mainly in uh, in Bombay and its suburbs. Uh, at the their their maximum, uh, they they numbered about 20,000. That was that was around the time of uh, of independence. And uh, what's what's happened? I think this is a, a typical story uh for for a lot of uh diasporic places a lot of those jews have made aliyah and uh and so there are large communities of uh, ben israel jews in in israel uh and uh there are i think some inter interesting accounts of of uh their uh their assimilation their their isolation their experiences there's a great movie called uh turn left at the end of the world uh, that's uh, that's about one one such family in Beersheba, and uh, yeah, there's uh, there's a lot that I could say. I think about uh, their experience in Israel, but in in uh, India, there's uh, the these Jews were the first to arrive um, in in India. Uh, it's said around around uh, the the first century. CE the first the first century so approximately 2000 years ago these uh these Jews uh potentially uh, you know due to bad weather due to uh bad navigation uh found themselves shipwrecked in India uh so they uh they discovered they discovered India quite a bit before uh you know Columbus attempted to and uh it was just a boat a boat full but they established their their settlement here on the Konkan coast, on the west coast of India, and uh, it uh, you know it's not well documented. But the oldest known settlement, uh, ironically, uh, in a, it's in a place called uh, Naugao, which means new new town. Uh, it's uh, there's a graveyard there, and uh, supposedly there there are. Uh, indications archaeological indications that it is approximately 2000 years old uh so uh 
I'll just take you through a little bit of the photography that um, I, I've uh, assembled with with uh, the help of uh, a friend of mine, uh, Julian Silverman, who's a, a professor at uh, R RMIT in Melbourne, uh, an Australian Jew. Uh, he's uh, he's been traveling all over the world documenting uh, Jewish communities, diaspora communities. Uh, and this uh, this trip was really fascinating and eye-opening, and I uh, was really, uh, really happy to be able to, to, to see a, a lot of this heritage that uh, I don't know, I don't know if I would have been able to explore. I've certainly um, met a number of, of Jews uh, in, Bombay, uh, not only because uh, you know uh, they're uh, they're they're active in, and they're um, you know they're active in Jewish groups, but they're also active in a lot of uh, civil society groups and uh, worldwide institution. I I, I met one uh, through Amnesty International, for instance, and uh, a lot of these uh, these uh, uh, Bene Israel Jews. Because they are so well assimilated, uh, they are they are Marathi speakers, uh, which is the local language in uh, in Bombay and Maharashtra. They are middle class. They're professionals. Uh, it, it wouldn't be possible to distinguish them from uh, from non Jews uh, if you if you weren't looking. You 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 certainly wouldn't see it. And I think uh, one one aspect of this that you'll you'll notice is that. Uh, Outside of their religious practices, uh, you won't see Jews tending to uh, to differentiate their, themselves. I think that's uh, in itself it's a uh, you know a, an acknowledgement and uh, it's a it's a demonstration of uh, India's ability to uh, to integrate to incorporate to. Uh, welcome a lot of different religious practices. So that's uh, that's great. This uh, this picture comes from Ali Bag, which, uh, as you can see, it's on the coast right there. Uh, and uh, this is this is sort of the largest town in the Konkan. Uh, and these these Jews, the Bene Israel Jews, for many centuries were were known as the Shani Varteli, which means the uh, the Saturday oil pressers. They they were known as an as an oil pressing caste, and they were known as uh, as uh, the, the the people who took Saturdays off, and that was that was essentially all that was uh, that was known or acknowledged, uh, at, you know, until uh, really the modern era, uh, around the 1800s, it it was you know sort of. Uh, Discovered by global jewelry that this was this was another group that uh, you know that had had these connections, long-standing connections to uh, to Judaism. Uh, so here you can see this is uh, you know this is uh, seeds being pressed. This uh, this traditional way of uh, of extracting oil still going on today in a lot of these uh, communities, a lot of these smaller villages. Uh, this is a this is another spot in the Konkan, and you can see we've got inscriptions in three languages here: uh, Hebrew in the middle, and it's a it's a, a verse. Uh, uh, and then we've got on the left Urdu, which is one of the languages spoken uh, in the western part of India. Certainly, Urdu uh, similar to Hindi. Uh, but written, as you can see, in this uh, Persian script, Nastalik. And on the right, what we're looking at is Marathi, which is the local language. And uh, what it says is that uh, this, uh, this synagogue was established in 1791, essentially. And it names, uh, it names the, uh, the uh, was it uh, Ishak uh, Sogankar uh, is the name of the uh, the the builder of this synagogue and his wife, uh, and uh, it says that they uh, they spent fourteen hundred rupees on it, which at that time was a a, a princely sum, I'm sure. Right now, it's uh, that's about uh, twenty dollars, but uh, at that time, 
uh, quite monumental. And uh, this is the inscription that uh, it, it leads into this, uh, this synagogue in Korlai. And you can see that uh, these buildings uh, are, you know, pretty, pretty modest. Uh, they're, uh, you know, they, they have a, a very lived in quality, a homely quality, which is not the case in, um, in Bombay. And you'll, you'll see, you'll see some of those synagogues quite, quite majestic. Uh, but they, uh, they're, they're to this day, well used and, uh, you know, taken care of quite a bit. You can see, uh, inside the synagogue itself, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of Hebrew, uh, inscriptions, including, uh, commandments and so forth. Uh, and then you can also see, oh, maybe I didn't include that one. You can also see a lot of Marathi as well and and uh you know those languages the the um you know the the language of the um of uh, ritual and then the the vernacular existing side by side will you get to see a lot more of that uh this is a, a just a, a i think a cute little representation of of this town or lie. Uh, that's the uh, uh, the checkered house right there. That's a that's a Jewish household, uh, and we were uh, we were invited to a meal there, which was which was beautiful. This uh, you can see the mosque in the the background. Uh, that's something that uh, you know they exists in even the the smallest towns here. You can see, um, you know. Uh, I think folks uh, going about their business, I, I think it's fair to assume that they're majority Hindu. Although in Korlai, one thing that we know is there's a lot of Catholics, uh, a lot of Christian representation as well. Uh, and in fact, the uh, the uh, the woman of the house here who served us the meal was a, a Catholic convert to Judaism. And she, uh, uh, you know, she, she didn't even think that was a, uh, a noteworthy, uh, uh, not even worth mentioning. It just after some questioning, how did she learn these recipes? Where did she pick them up from? She happened to tell us, okay, these are, uh, you know, uh, these are recipes I learned after, after I converted. And uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's very interesting to see how these uh, different religions, uh, you know, practice side by side and also borrow syncretically uh, the uh, uh, you know different practices from one another and uh, you don't really see any uh, Jewish uh, iconography here on the house but if you look on the lower left you'll see uh, you'll see some pink bricks and I'll just I'll blow those up for you you can see that these are uh, these are uh, symbols that that show up everywhere in India actually they're uh, the 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 star of david is uh it's also something that's been used uh quite a bit in uh, hindu iconography and uh here it's called the ganesh yantra it has some sort of uh astrological uh significance that i don't completely understand but uh it's not uncommon to see uh a star of david um even alongside a swastika, for instance, a swastika being another ancient Hindu symbol that's uh, that's used frequently, and you'll see you'll see on gates uh, outside households. So, so those two are everywhere. It's uh, it's uh, it's often a surprise. And then when you you move inside the household, you can see there's uh, you know there's uh, there's some Marathi writing there, and as well uh, a little inscription here: prayer for the household in uh, in Hebrew as well uh it's uh you know again it's 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 a liturgical language it's not it's not spoken but uh it's uh it's definitely very common to see uh first of all this hamsa in a lot of places as a symbol used uh used all over and uh as well lots of uh, i guess you could call them shrines in a way this is one uh aspect of of indian life that's been incorporated into Jewish life, uh, that there's often a corner of the household that's, uh, you know, devoted to religious symbolism with, um, you know, with Hindu households, it might be uh, Ganesha, with Christian households, it'll certainly be uh, Jesus, 
with Muslims, it'll be the Kaaba. Uh, and in, uh, in Jewish households, mo most likely uh, Rabbi Hillel, or uh, very frequently in the Konkin, it's, it's uh, Elijah. And you'll see there's a, it's a lot of uh, iconography later on related to Eliyahu and the um, particular role that he plays in, uh, in, uh, in Indian life. These are just some posters, some, some photos on the wall of this house. I just thought uh, <laughs> this, uh, this guy looks a lot like my dad and uh, reminded, me, reminded me of some family photos that, that uh, came from the same era. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, uh, there's no indication in this family that they're, uh, they're Jews, certainly not practicing Jews. But you see how the house is built. There's, uh, you know, some incredible wrought iron work done, uh, you know, all over India. And, and here you can see they've got uh, uh, some, uh, some menorahs built in to their window grates. And I believe that's a, a tzaddik in, uh, in, the, in the middle of that star, David. It's backwards, right? Because we're looking, we're looking from the inside out. So meant to meant to be read from the outside. Uh, I did not uh, have a chance to ask the significance of that, but uh, yeah, we have we have in our uh, house here the uh, the uh, initials of my landlord's father. It's also nice. Uh, we uh, we were also able to eat some some very uh, interesting food. It was uh, it was uh, I believe the. The, the week after Tisha B'Av, when we were visiting these households and they were eating some specific kinds of fasting foods. Uh, you know, fasting being a, um, being a, a very uh, particular um, uh, idea in India that I, I think that we don't, we don't practice. It really means the, the exclusion of certain items from a diet rather than the total cessation of, uh, of food or drink. Uh, so that's a, it's a very frequent occurrence in lots of religions here. And what you'll see is that uh, this lady serving us a meal uh, made of these, uh, these beans. Uh, they're known as wali uh, here in the Konkin. And that's a, it's a, a dish that's particularly, uh, it's uh it's supposed to avoid uh, grains. It's supposed to avoid uh, certainly sugars. And th there's a, a whole set of restrictions that people will observe, uh, not just on holidays, but surrounding holidays in order to, uh, to mark those occasions. Uh, and it's also delicious. Uh, I'm going to take you now to Bombay uh, or Mumbai. This is, this is where I spent the majority of my time uh, in India, and uh, it's as you can see, is a big chaotic metropolis. Uh, but this is where the majority of of, of Indian Jews now live, uh, both the Bene Israel and the Baghdadi. Uh, so I uh, just take you through a few of these spots that uh, that are significant: some uh, some uh, synagogues as well as uh, some homes. Uh, and I'll just show you. This is uh, right here. This is, uh, you could say, the, the main, the central synagogue for, uh, for Bene Israel Jews. Uh, it's, in, uh, it's in a part of town that's a very uh, middle class part of town. It's a, it's a, you know, you can see that this uh, is quite a large structure and a quite an, an old structure as well. Uh, you can see also that they're, celebrating their 150th anniversary. Uh, sorry for the, uh, this was taken on my flip phone, I believe, <laughs> back in the day, uh, in uh, 2011. So now I guess we're on to 160. Oh, it's, uh, you know, this is a fairly, fairly old building in continuous usage uh, for, for over 160 years. Uh, and, uh, it's uh, it's just there in the middle of the neighborhood, uh, pretty much unremarkable. There is a Jewish high school next door, as you can see. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. But was that built by David Sassoon? Uh, there there was some involvement by David Sassoon, and I'll actually show you a, a building that that was built by David Sassoon later. Uh, 
Sassoon being uh, amongst the Baghdadi Jews. And there is certainly uh, a lot shared between the two communities. Uh, David Sassoon is, is certainly the preeminent figure of, of Indian Jewry in, you know, in terms of his, his influence, his reach, uh, his munificence. And, uh, and so a lot of these places will be marked with the Sassoon name. So yeah, you, you'll see here it says uh, E.E.E. -E -E Sassoon. Uh, I'm not quite sure which Sassoon that would have been, but certainly a descendant of David Sassoon. It's and the uh, if the sign is there, uh, if you look to the, the lower right of the synagogue, there's an orange sign there that, that says E.E.E. -E -E Sassoon High School. Uh, we'll see, we'll see quite a bit more of the, the Sassoons and their, uh, you know, their uh, bequests later on. Th this, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, he, you know, one Sassoon would have been involved in this, but it seems to me that David Sassoon himself would, would not have been around uh, 160 years ago. He, uh, he was born in the 1700s. I'll, I'll have to I'll have to check the dates, but I believe that I believe by by that time he 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 would have been uh, he he would have passed away. But then his his children certainly would have been involved in the construction of the synagogue. That's an excellent uh, question. Uh, so when we move on, you'll see that there are, there are all different sorts of buildings here. This this one, this very um, fortress like one is what I would say is the sort of uh, the most uh, most uh, frequented synagogue in in Bombay and you know therefore in in all of India this is this is called Sha'ar Hashemayim and this it's located in a, a a suburb of Mumbai called Tane where the, the now the majority of the Bene Israel live uh, say 2,000 of them so this is uh, this is a place where I've attended uh, high holy day services, and while uh, while that's happening inside, you'll get on the outside um, the uh, Navratri rituals, which uh, that's a Hindu festival happening at the same time, uh, more or less, you know, also on the lunar calendar, uh, and that will involve some fireworks. It will involve some brass bands. Uh, it'll involve some uh you know different kinds of uh parades and uh <laughs> it's quite an interesting call and response you know uh or uh, i like to say a remix of cold nidre and all of the uh the high holy day favorites with with uh, all that excitement happening outside uh it's very interesting uh we have you know in addition some very modest uh you know these are these are buildings that are from some some of the the uh, earliest uh, Ben Israel uh, communities. This one, uh, it's it's really no bigger than a hut, but it's used uh, still to this day as a prayer hall. Uh, and you can see also this one has uh, has police protection. Uh, that's not the case today, but it was the case for quite uh, some time after the uh, the uh, terrorist attacks of uh, 2008 that was uh, you know uh, 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 Pakistani terrorists targeting not uh, Indian Jews but um, but amongst other uh, locations the Chabad uh, house in in Mumbai so targeting European Jews uh, in in Mumbai uh, now I'm just going to take you inside a uh, Ben Israel household uh this is uh this is the home of the uh Girads, who uh who were our uh hosts uh and uh you know there's a uh, um one member of that family nathaniel who's uh approximately my age and uh uh used to spend quite a bit of time with him uh but the Girads were also known as Girardkars. Girard is a is a town in the konkan and uh it's the practice in uh in Marathi to name yourself after your uh, your hometown. So uh, someone from Mumbai is a Mumbaikar. Someone from Jirad is a Jiradkar. Uh, they they went as uh, as Jiradkar for several years, and now now as uh, much of the family is uh, making Aliyah, including Nathaniel, they uh, they've now started calling themselves uh, Jirad. 
Um, this uh, this uh, plate here, this tray that you're seeing of uh, bananas, of uh, beaten rice, of uh, dates, of a, a flower garland, and also of yellow uh, roses. The yellow roses are there because they were Nehru's favorites. Uh, Jawaharlal Nehru being India's first prime minister and also uh, biggest champion of, uh, of pluralism, you could say. Uh, so this, this entire tray is uh, known as Malida. It's, uh, it's a particular kind of offering of uh, sweets. Uh, the rice itself will, will be sweetened somewhat, and then the dates and, and fruits. So it's, um, it's a type of, uh, I think it's fair to say it's a puja. It's a, it's a type of uh, Indian uh, blessing that's being bestowed for uh, a simcha, for a, for a sweet occasion. And I think uh, uh, the occasion here had to do with, uh, you know, uh, Nathaniel's passing his, uh, his uh, uh, chartered accountant's exam. Definitely a simcha, uh, and this is the uh, this is the prayer book for that uh, that Malida, and you can see it's it's written in a, a script, a Dev, the Devanagari script uh, that's used for Hindi. This is um, Marathi. the the book The cover of the book is in Marathi, and it says uh, Eliyahu Hanabi Cha Ashirvad. So this is the blessing of Elijah. Is uh, what's what's being uh, bestowed through this uh, this plate and the Marathi that's uh, uh, sorry the Devanagari script that's on the right with the with the open book is not Marathi it is uh, transliterated Hebrew so you you'll see uh, um, there's uh, there's a lot here the 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 top says men um, baticha pratna so this is the candle prayer. And it's exactly what you would expect. It's uh, it's um, Haner uh, Shel Eliyahu Hanabi Zakur La Teb. Okay, well, anyway, it's it's uh, it is uh, it's uh, very similar to the the all the types of uh, prayers we would be saying over uh, Shabbat candles, Hanukkah candles. It's uh, it's being transcribed into uh, this uh, script because this is the script that uh, that's used in daily life and it's uh, you know it's what uh, most of the population Ben Israel population will be most familiar with. I'm just zooming in here to this uh, this uh, image on the cover. This uh, this is the uh, depiction of Elijah uh, in, a, in a chariot of fire that is um, it's seen in a lot of uh, of Ben Israel households, as well as in a lot of synagogues, and it's said that there is a spot uh, on the coast near uh, Korlai, where we just saw where this chariot touched down, and there's an imprint of it. So that's this is uh, it's a spot that's that's revered by the um, the Ben Israel Jews, and and he's got a special uh, significance to them. This is the the rest of the meal that we had that that day, and uh, it's it's uh, not so different, I think, from a lot of uh, you could say Maharashtrian or Konkan food. It, there's a lot of fried fish involved. This one is uh, is kingfish, and that fish is uh, masala fried or rava fried, which is just to say that it's dipped in a lot of spices before it's fried. Uh, there are lots of different uh, items here. Uh, there's a steamed bread uh, called sannas. There's one uh, called, uh, there's a chapati there. So lots of uh, what you would say uh, is, is Indian food, but then, uh, you know, it's done a specific way in this household. Uh, you know, their, their, their diet, I would say, is pretty similar to the diet of, uh, you know, their neighbors who might be Hindu, might be Catholic. I wanted to show you this one because this is my favorite. This is uh, Shepuchi Bhaji. Uh, it's dill. And uh, dill uh, grows, uh, grows wild here. It grows, uh, it's, you know, it's cultivated and it's used not, uh, you know, like an herb to flavor your chicken soup. It's, it's used like any other uh, leafy vegetable like spinach 
or uh, radish greens. They'll stir fry it. This is um, chana dal. It's a you know type of chickpea, and uh, you know it's quite flavorful. This is one of my favorite dishes. They made it special for me, so I, I thought I would show it off. All right. Uh, so that's a you know just a, a little tour through the lives of the Bene Israel. Um, and I just uh, I'll I'll offer you this uh, this link as well. This is the the film made by uh, by Julian, uh, my friend, and uh, Ralphie Gerard, Nathaniel's father. Uh, and it's uh, it's it's there on YouTube. I'll I'll leave that link for you uh, later on so you can take a look. Uh, it does a great job of um, of uh, capturing a lot a lot of the detail uh, that I I won't be able to cover. Uh, how am I doing on time? <laughs> I think I'll just just plow through here. Uh, You're doing fine. I mean, it's okay. fascinating. I just got a, uh, a notice about a uh, program called the Sassoon, the Great Global Merchants and the Making of an Empire with Joseph Sassoon. Literally just came into my in-basket. Amazing. Amazing. Well, you know the Sassoon. Uh, actually, the, we're we're going to start discussing them now because we're moving on to Baghdadi Jews. Uh, Sassoons are in the news uh, today. Uh, the New York Times is reporting there's a a, a Hebrew Bible. I don't know if technically you can call it a Torah because it's a it's a codex. It's not a scroll, uh, but it's uh, it's the 24 books uh, of of the uh, of the Old Testament, and it is. Um, it's uh, you know written by hand in Hebrew. It's the oldest known uh, such uh, uh, manuscript, so it's uh, it's being uh, auctioned at Sotheby's this week for somewhere in the neighborhood of thirty million, uh, thirty million pounds, I believe. So that's anyway that's uh, that's known as the Sassoon Codex, uh, because at some point, even though it was, it was uh, written somewhere uh, in the eleventh century. It, uh, it passed through the hands of those Sassoons, like uh, like a lot of uh, items traded and uh, you know otherwise. So uh, uh, next group of Jews I, I'd like to discuss it, they're the Baghdadi Jews. They're they're so called because they came from uh, from Iraq and uh, and Baghdad. Uh, uh, David Sassoon, who we mentioned, was at one point the treasurer of Baghdad before he was um you know essentially exiled uh chased out by the uh the the shah i believe it was dawood shah uh you know in the the late 1700s uh these jews came via persia uh to bombay uh because bombay at that time the early 1800s was one of the world centers of trade uh you know, it was it was uh, being used by the British Empire for all sorts of things, and um, these Jews certainly spread out to uh, a number of other uh, uh, cities in India, Ahmedabad, Pune, uh, Calcutta, uh, but but mostly I would say in Mumbai. And uh, I've just got some images of Sassoon. These are daguerreotypes uh, taken sometime in the early 1800s. Uh, there on the left with his children, one of which I believe would be David Sassoon. Sorry, um, uh, would be uh, uh, Ruben Ruben Sassoon, uh, and then of course the, all all the other Sassoons we'll hear about. Uh, you know, in addition to being prosperous merchants, they also funded uh, a lot of the uh, the monuments in uh, in Bombay, including this one, the Gateway of India. And you can see this, uh, you know, is the uh, the focal point of a lot of uh, of uh, British military exercises. This is where the uh, the king was welcomed uh, on his visit to India, or the emperor, I guess you would say at that time. Uh, this was uh, this was funded by Sassoon money. This uh, this is in in a way, you know, it's in the the Indo Saracenic style, as they say. But it's definitely a Jewish construction in lots of ways. So this is this marks the entrance to Bombay Harbor, and the docks uh, of Bombay Harbor are to this day known as the Sassoon Docks. 
Um, this is uh, the interior of Knesset Aliyahu, which is the, um, the uh, sort of central synagogue. Uh, it's, or the, it's, uh, it's located in what you might call downtown uh, or South Bombay. Uh, and as you can see, it's quite a bit more lavishly ornamented. It's, uh, it's beautifully constructed and it's very well maintained. And that's, uh, that is again, the legacy of David Sassoon here. Um, this is the, the outside of the building. Uh, this is also, as it happens, it's uh, significant to me because it's where I, I first met uh, Meghna, my, my wife, uh, right in front of here. We were crossing paths and uh, just so happened we were crossing paths right, uh, right in front of the building. So um, this, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, an old, it's an older building. It's done in the, oops, the Sephardic style uh, on the inside. I thought I had a slide of this, but essentially what you can make out from here is that the, uh, there's a gallery around uh, this gallery usually um usually for for women women and children and uh ordinarily men uh down on the on the ground floor although uh it's not a strict uh segregation of genders uh the the practice is uh you know roughly uh, speaking orthodox uh but then the gallery uh, around below uh, surrounds the the bima, which is in the center, and uh, you can sort of make out the uh, the uh, the the chandelier, the candelabra that's that's there over the the bima and the you know the lectern where the Torah is read. Um, Matt, if I could make a suggestion, why don't we look at uh, opening up the questions in about five minutes or so, yeah. so everybody has a chance. Sounds great. You know the the other groups of Jews here. We we've just we've just covered ninety nine percent of Indian Jews, and now they're uh, we're going to move on to a few a few much smaller groups. And uh, you know, although there's plenty to say about them, there's uh, unfortunately not so many of them to say it about. So I think I think we can move through them pretty quickly. The the next group of Jews, uh, they come from uh, Kerala, which is much further south. It's the southern. Uh, the southwest tip of India, and uh, mostly in a city uh, called Kochi or Cochin. Uh, they're known as the Pardesi Jews because, uh, or sometimes Malabari Jews, because this is known as the Malabar Coast down here, Konkan Coast a little further north, Malabar Coast down south. Uh, and Pardesi, uh, the, the title that's been given to them, means uh, outsider, essentially. These, uh, these are Jews who are, even though, uh, you know, Kerala in particular has been a, a site of um, proselytizing of, of, you know, of religious, uh, it's been a, it's a hotbed of religious activity since, uh, you know, it, since uh, St. Thomas uh, visited there uh, somewhere, uh, you know, in the, the, the first century. Uh, these these Jews are they are actually Iberian Jews, uh, the Pardesis. They they came in the 15th and 16th century uh, to India from uh, Spain and uh, Portugal, which you know had its own Inquisition, and um, they they found their way somehow to uh, you know via the Middle East to uh, to uh, India and settled here in a place that's now known as Jewtown. Uh, this is, uh, it's a, it's a pretty, uh, you know, narrow lane in, um, in Cochin, uh, but it's, you know, it's capped with this, uh, this synagogue, quite a stately synagogue. You can see the date on that, 1760. And uh, here's a better representation, I think, of the, the you know, the Sephardic synagogue in here. Where you know again the the bima and the lectern is there right in the in the center of the synagogue and the um, the pews the the benches the seating are placed more or less any which way. Uh, so it's uh, this one it's uh, it's not quite as lavish but it's it's built very beautifully into the life of the town. Now there's uh, barely a minion 
uh, left in, in Jewtown uh, because of the successful waves of Aliyah, but, uh, you know, continues to be supported by, uh, by tourists, by Chabad, uh, and uh, there's quite a bit, in this, this area has become a center of tourism, and uh, in fact, it's now at this very moment part of uh, a, a, an art exhibit, uh, the uh, the Kochi Biennale, and it's uh, it's being done uh, beautifully with uh, not just murals but some some really fascinating ex exhibitions. So uh, those those Jews, the the handful that are left, have uh, you know found ways to stay relevant in the um, you know this uh, the new economy and. And hopefully to collect, uh, you know, enough uh, enough attention, enough uh, well wishes to 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 stay uh, to stay solvent, <laughs> and to to remain uh, to remain uh, uh, to continue to maintain these landmarks. All right, and then we have some real, uh, I think, uh, some sort of fascinating footnotes here. Uh, the the last couple groups of Jews are, uh, as I was saying, modern Jews. They are um, they are uh, self styled as the the lost tribes. Two of the lost tribes of Israel. Uh, this group, uh, which is located in the far northeast of India, uh, there are there are seven states in the in the northeast. You can see connected by just a the thinnest strip of land known as the, as the chicken neck there uh, to the rest of India. That. Uh, they they come from a state uh, called Mizoram, and these uh, ethnically Mizo uh, Indians, they uh, you know had uh, earlier been converted to Christianity. Uh, lots of um, mostly Baptist uh, missionaries, I think, made their way out here in the 1800s. The British British missionary, missionaries, and uh, they uh, discovered uh, at some point that. One of their legendary ancestors, uh, named Manmasi, uh, shared a name with one of the tribes of Israel, uh, Manasseh, uh, who was one of the the sons of Joseph, and they uh, they began adopting Jewish customs. They you could say they sort of reversed engineered their Christianity. Uh, they they uh, they started with a, a sort of messianic form of Judaism. And uh, increasingly, after contact with outside Jewish groups, they uh, started practicing more uh, standard normative forms of, of Judaism, rabbinical Judaism. And finally, uh, by 2005, they were recognized uh, as Jews by the chief rabbinate of Israel. Uh, now there are over 3,000 of them in Israel. Uh, here's, here's a group making Aliyah right here. Uh, and as you can see, these are um, they're Indians, but they are they are from various Burmese, Tibetan ethnic groups, the the Mizo, the Chin, uh, and they are they are um, they have their own identity, and part of that identity that they've crafted for themselves is uh, is a Jewish identity. Uh, and one more here that is an even more modern group of Jews. Uh, come from a, a, a tiny place, a very uh, impoverished part of India. Uh, they're they're known as the Bnei Ephraim, and uh, Ephraim being another one of the um, the uh, the lost tribes. And uh, here we go. This is a Sukkot celebration. This is a sukkah that was constructed there uh, in uh, in that uh, southeastern part of India, and this is the entire community. Of uh, Bnei Ephraim Jews, uh, but they have they've adopted Jewish practice. Uh, they've started learning Hebrew, and uh, you know, <laughs> it it remains to be seen where where they'll that will take them. But uh, these uh, these Jews are otherwise uh, Telugu speakers. Uh, Telugu being the the language of that that area, uh, they've somehow uh, come to. This uh, the same sort of Jewish practice, and uh, now there's lots of uh, uh, groups, uh, you know, uh, international groups that are reaching out to them, and uh, potentially we'll see the same uh, pattern trajectory of Aliyah for for them as well. Uh, and then last, I'll just mention that here in Goa, uh, we uh, 
we are uh, host to a large number of Israelis, probably outnumbering all the other Jews in India. Uh, the Israelis uh, often, right after their military service, will come to Goa, and uh, many of them will just stay. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's been a, a a tourist destination since. Uh, uh, you know, since the 60s and in the 80s, I think, became a focal point for a lot of hippies and, uh, you know, Israeli hippies amongst them. And uh, now a lot of these uh, Jews are, uh, you know, here <laughs> doing all sorts of things. These, This is Lior on the left and David on the right. And uh, they are playing uh, on Friday at our restaurant uh, as part of an African disco band. So uh, you can see that uh, that uh, Jews are up to all sorts of uh, exciting things here in India. And just uh, recap here: all these uh, different groups that you just heard about, lots of um, lots of diversity, lots of interesting stuff. And I um, I think with that, I will say dhanyavad uh, uh, and thank you. And uh, I'll just uh, I'll just throw it open for questions. That was uh, fascinating. Thank you, Matt. Um, we had a few people send in, in questions on chat, and let me just read uh, those, and then we can open it to others. Um, Rabbi mentioned that the Rare Book Library at Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati has a large collection of 17th and 18th century Cochin uh, prayer books and other texts. Fascinating. I, I will I'll have to make my way back to Cincinnati. Right. It's a, it's in the it's worth seeing. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Amy Storer, one of our uh, viewers, asked you, she said, I like your jacket, Matt. Is there a story behind it? Here we go. I'm just uh, going to show everybody my jacket again. Uh, <laughs> there is a story behind it. Uh, thank you for asking, Amy. Uh, this is, uh, this is part of my, uh, my wedding outfit, actually. Oh. This is, um, it's made out of a particular type of, uh, Indian cloth known as ikat, uh, which is dyed before it's woven. Uh, so it's, a it's a bit of a, a heavier construction, this jacket, you know, uh, since we were uh since the wedding was in january i thought okay let's let's go with something a little bit heavier uh it does get a little nippy here you know probably into the low 70s mm. at night uh <laughs> <laughs> you know we're yeah. used to we're used to a lot uh a lot worse i think it's probably mid 80s here right now uh at uh, at 2 a.m. uh february being the beginning of the warmer season uh, right. But uh, yeah, I have uh, now a suit, a suit made out of this uh, cloth, the pants included. I'm not, I'm not wearing them right now, so I won't, uh, I won't show you that. But this is, you know, something that I, I, um, I saw and in, I instantly thought this is, uh, this is something that it's, uh, it's ethnic without being, uh, you know, uh, I think too, uh, too uh, patronizing. <laughs> you know, to, to ethnic wear. So I, I, um, I also thought here's something that, uh, I won't just wear once. Here's something that I really, uh, I think it's a, a, it's an exciting piece and I hope I get to wear it, uh, uh, you know, many times in the future. And, uh, and here we are. Very good. Do we have any other, a uh, norm? Matt, Matt, just doing a, a, a quick biography from Michigan, Harvard, you know, what, what what sure. brought you to India and then to begin to begin? Sure. Well, uh, I mean, I think what started everything is, uh, you know, I was uh, bar mitzvahed by Rabbi Roman. Uh, I remember it well. And, yeah, yeah. The ninety three, I think that was, and uh, uh, you know, from uh, from Michigan, I uh, I moved on to Harvard, and uh, since since age seventeen. Uh, you know, I've basically been uh, been traveling. I think you can say uh, one fascinating thing about Harvard uh, is that uh, 
academically, I think, uh, you know, left a lot <laughs> to be, uh, uh, left, left, a, left a lot to the imagination, but then <laughs> uh, extracurricularly, there, there's, there are just so many fascinating organizations there that have been around for uh, decades and in some cases centuries. And one, one of those, it's called Let's Go. It's a, a travel guide that, uh, you know, until recently was available on bookshelves all around the world. Uh, and it was written, researched, edited, designed, published entirely by Harvard students. Mm -hmm. so that was a great introduction to the publishing industry for me. As, uh, you know, somebody who dabbled in graphic design, it was one of my ways uh, into publication design. Uh, I started out there as a, uh, a map maker. Uh, you know, because I had the familiarity with the tools of map making. And eventually I wound up um, editing, uh, managing. I uh, eventually got <laughs> got them to send me to India, uh, where I did uh, some some research and writing and eventually also some journalism. And, uh, you know, from there, I really felt like there was a, a great opportunity. One one thing that happened to me was that while while I was looking for some interview subjects, I uh, stumbled across a volunteering opportunity with uh, an organization called Dr. Reddy's Labs. Uh, Dr. Reddy's being one of the large, largest uh, generic drug manufacturers. And they had, uh, they had started a school training uh, students without any computer skills, without any qualifications, not even their high school uh, passing certificate in, uh, you know, skills needed to join the digital economy. So, I wrote a, uh, a graphic design curriculum and I taught a batch. And what I saw was that uh, these, these kids who were supposedly unqualified had so much enthusiasm, had so much aptitude that there was, there was just, it was evident to me that there was just a lot of untapped potential there. And I thought, okay, at some point I'm gonna come back and figure out a way to, to you know, make, make this sustainable. And, uh, you know, I spent uh, five years in New York in the publishing industry. And uh, finally I said, okay, I'm gonna do it. And um, moved to Bombay in 2005. I, uh, I was practicing as a graphic designer. I was uh, teaching at a number of different uh, NGOs and uh, community centers with, uh, with computer labs. And uh, using that curriculum, uh, then hiring those kids that I had I had taught to do all different kinds of design work and uh, continued like that for about uh, 10 years. At which point I met uh, Meghna, who's now my wife. Uh, and very quickly, we stumbled into this opportunity here in Goa. Um, I had, uh, you know, on the side been uh, been you know, enjoying a lot of different um, uh, food related activities, including um, taking part in a, a series of pop up dinners uh, called Secret Supper that, uh, you know, basically took us to a different part of the city uh, with a different cuisine, a different decor, a different theme every month. And, uh, it, you know, got me, I think, a little bit overconfident in that uh, I was able to to make uh, dinners, uh, you know, multiple course dinners for uh, 40 to 50 people uh, with, uh, you know, decent regularity. So I thought, how hard could it be to, uh, to serve 40 or 50 people in a restaurant? Mm. Uh, quite a bit harder, as it turned out. Uh, and it was a very steep learning curve to begin with. Um, Megna and I were doing everything ourselves, all the cooking, all the serving, all the bartending. Uh, and, uh, it was, it was, <laughs> it was certainly the hardest thing I've ever done, uh, and probably the most rewarding as well. And, uh, uh, surprisingly, uh, we, we managed not only to su survive, but we, we gained a real, um, devoted following. And, uh, now it's, we're in our eighth season here in, uh, in, uh, in Goa now, one one problem with this uh, this this plan is that uh, for about six months out of the year, there's nothing happening here. Uh, mm -hmm. The tourist season uh, roughly stretches from November to April, 
and we we uh, we didn't realize, but the whole the whole place was basically covered in in tarp between uh, May through uh, September or October because that's monsoon. And uh, being close to the coast, monsoon it's very violent. Uh, it's really you know raw nature, and it, and there's it's very difficult to keep a place open, uh, let alone to draw a crowd. Uh, you know, sufficient to keep a place open. So we uh, we came up with a scheme uh, along with my parents, who uh, you can see somewhere somewhere in your uh, grid of squares uh, there, yeah. Ruth and Larry, to uh, to start something in in uh, Detroit. You know, I'd I'd always wanted an excuse to spend more time uh, with them, and uh, you know, wanted uh, wanted uh, them to be involved in something as well. So. Uh, the four of us, uh, Meghna, myself, and my folks, uh, came up with this uh, crazy scheme. And I, I think really it was more the pun of New Delhi that started everything off. And we said, well, what would that look like? And once we uh, saw what it would look like, we said, okay, we got to try it. And uh, very similarly, it's it's been, uh, you know, uh, seven seasons of that that we've completed. And uh, it's also amassed a really uh devoted cult following uh and people will literally chase us around town uh asking when they can have their next uh new reuben uh so that's uh that's brought me to this point and uh you know we'll see we'll see where it takes us in the future wonderful any other folks have questions well first i'd like to say this was um quite an eye-opener i've been to india many times and didn't know about these different Jewish communities over there. Uh, haven't been to Goa. That's always been on the list. Um, my question to you is, how can we get your tomato chutney? <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Well, uh, you know, it's available in a number of stores in the Metro Detroit area, <laughs> but uh -huh. not yet uh, available, uh, you know, in in uh, national chains. But I'm sure that we uh, we can ship one to you. and. Uh, you know, if you like it, then maybe we could ship a few more. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a great, it's a great addition to all sorts of things. You know, it's great on burgers and dogs. It's great as a, um, you know, as a, as a kind of a, a dip with, um, with, uh, you know, with cheeses and crackers. It's great with, um, as a marinade. Uh, you know, I know some people just sort of pour it over a piece of fish and broil it. And it gives it a really exciting uh, zip and uh, you know a little bit of a pop from those mustard seeds as well. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's something that I think once you start using it, you'll find, you'll find all sorts of interesting uh, you know, uses for it, not just, uh, not just as a hamburger topping. Yeah. Uh, so, so yes, if, if, uh, if uh, we can find a way to get your uh, your address, then we'll 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 find a way to ship some. Well, better okay. than that, better than that, I'm suggesting maybe if you have items that are shippable, you could maybe put together a list, and we could circulate that around. Talk in a discussion about this talk today, and then ask people if they're interested, because obviously, uh, ten cans or jars would cost less to ship uh, than than one. You know, so if we get enough interest, maybe that's something uh, yeah. we could do. I know uh, Lynn we'll Roman. Get your wholesale rate. <laughs> yeah, the rabbi's wife's always going to Kansas for bulky items, so maybe we could add India to the list of items that we order periodically. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want to say. Okay, go ahead. I, I want to jump in with a with a thank you. I do have to get going. I have to drive up to a meeting, but uh, Matt, thank you so so much warm warm regards and mazel tov again uh it's good to see you and your folks as well uh regards to the whole extended family all over the world and uh hope maybe we'll get thanks to see much. you over the summer back in detroit thanks my thanks regards for to saying this. And thank you for saying this up rabbi yeah. this this has been very interesting oh, my pleasure my honor thanks yeah. everyone be well okay thank you I have a, a couple of questions, Matt. Um, one is uh, I've been reading recently in certain Indian states about the uh, uh, friction that's going on between Muslim minorities and Hindu, and I forget the term they use for 
uh, I'm not sure if it's jihad uh, it, uh, or something like that regarding the mixed marriage and the stories that are developed about that sort of thing. And there was a lot of uh, written up in the magazine I read, the Week magazine. So I was just wondering uh, what's been your awareness of that. Yeah, you're exactly right, Mike. There, there's a there's a term that's been floated around that's uh, that's love jihad. Love jihad, right? right. This uh, idea that Muslims are uh, are converting Hindus through marriage, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I think there's a certain amount of I would say demographic paranoia uh, that you see in India and you see in in uh, a lot of other places. But, you know, in India, it's particularly focused on the Muslim minority, which is um, somewhere around 22 percent, I believe, but is uh, is growing somewhat faster than the Hindu population, uh, you know, in, in large part because, you know, they, they're uh, by and large a more impoverished, less educated minority and uh you know that's that's just the story with uh, fertility rates everywhere. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the the there's, I think, all sorts of different kinds of discrimination that that are that's you know, it's un, un, unfortunately wielded against Muslims, not not in any way against uh, Jews, and I think uh, you know in in part there's there's a, a kind of reaction amongst muslims that you know they're there it sort of confirms uh their identity as separate and different uh and i think that dynamic also we see uh in a lot of places elsewhere but but i do think that that there there always has been the option of uh assimilation or let me say of of pluralism where uh, you know, I think for for many years in India, uh, you know, communities were living side by side. Of course, there was the um, the you know the catastrophe of of partition. You know, upon independence, there was there was uh, horrific um, you know inter inter religious violence that uh, that that killed uh, you know uh, millions. Certainly. So it's uh, it's um, you know it's it's I think you know in a way that that memory is is very fresh, it, uh, for for a lot of people you know and in in their um, collective memory, it it exerts a kind of weight that um, I I think in in many ways the Holocaust uh, you know it has has a similar uh, influence in. Uh, you know, in the way that uh, that Jews and and Israelis also think about uh, their relationship to to outsiders, to others, it's uh, yeah, it, it's true that it's it's become a, a much more uh, intense phenomenon of late. That uh, mm -hmm. part of the agenda of the uh, the BJP, which is the the ruling um, Hindu nationalist party is to um you know basically uh create uh you know special rights for hindus and eliminate rights for minorities uh it's it's been happening it's already been enacted into law and i think uh you know part of that effort is uh it's a kind of rhetorical effort and you know phrases like love jihad I think kind of ratchet up that uh, temperature. And then uh, as you rightly point out, there have been uh, pogroms, there have been episodes of uh, religious violence, uh, especially in uh, those uh, states that are ruled, that, that, that are governed by, uh, by that Hindu nationalist party. You know, it's, 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 it's part of a coordinated campaign, I think. I have just one other question. I just happened to see uh, most of a movie last night that was up for an Academy Award this year. It's called RRR. Have you seen it? I have not seen it. I hear it's fantastic. I it hear the is. action scenes are full on. Oh my gosh! It's it's a 
an Indian action movie about the conflict between the, the British uh, people who were ruling India. It takes place about 1920, and it's semi-fictional. Uh, it, uh, it depicts two heroes of Indian culture who happen to meet and how this might play out if they actually met each other. And it's, it's the, the photography, the music, the story is very interesting, quite a bit of violence, but uh, definitely worth seeing. And I understand why it's up for awards. Yeah, it's, so that, uh, that film is, uh, it was made in Telugu, which is that, uh, that last language that I was talking yes. about. That's, uh, you know, it, it is uh, not the main, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the main language of the film industry would be Hindi. You know, and Bollywood yes. is a, is the cultural yes. force, but increasingly movies from from southern India made in those uh, those languages are are they're becoming much more technically sophisticated, and they're they're able to do things with uh, with larger budgets that that match not only what uh, Bollywood is able to do, but what what Hollywood is able to do. Mm -hmm. It's available on Netflix if anybody's interested. So, yeah, we'll hear it's a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to get that in because I just happened to start watching it. And it's just mind boggling. And it's something that you might want to go back and actually watch more than once. Is that just three letters, R, R, R? Yes, yes. Three capital R's. They stand both for uh, three nouns like revenge, revolt, et cetera. Or it, it also represents the names of, I think, the producers and directors and writers of the movie. Right. But uh, uh, it, it's very fascinating to watch. I mean, it's a large scale. I kept on thinking of Lawrence of Arabia, essentially, when I saw a good part of it. But uh, mm. that's quite something. Interesting comparison. Yeah. Well, everybody, um, if you don't have any other questions, I once again want to thank both Matt and his parents for participating. And, um, and uh, yeah, I think Ruth Ann, since I see her is sort of in the screen, she'll probably be available to, uh, to since she was the host, to end the, the viewing. But once again, we have recorded this. It will be put up, as she said, on YouTube later on. Um, there was something, you know, maybe we could follow up if there's some uh, attachments so we can send around to those who didn't attend as well as also pick up on the idea of maybe getting some of your food products over here. <laughs> yeah, sounds great. Yeah. So once again, thank you all. Um, and I think I'm going to shut down, but Ruth Ann, you'll, you'll uh, shut it down after everybody's off. Yep.